Welcome back to episode four of the Pixelmator Pro Masterclass, where today I'm gonna to show you the most powerful tools for photo editing, and it's not even close. Like, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that every single photo that you love, that you've seen on Instagram or anywhere else online, has used these specific tools. And the reason why they use these tools is because they allow you to selectively edit different pieces of your photo based on their color, their brightness, and other attributes, and change them in ways that makes them more appealing. So for today's edit, if you'd like to follow along, I'm going to be getting this edit out of this photo, and I'm going to link the original down below. It's available from our friends over at Signature Edits. They have a lot of tools for photo editors, but my favorite part is the photos they provide that are raw photos, freely available for you to practice your edits on. So make sure you go check that out, support them and download this photo so that you can follow along. Let's jump in. The first thing I always do when I'm setting up any new photo is I make sure that I have my histogram turned on and I start with luminance. So I change this to luminance. So now, as you may remember from our previous episode, there's a lot of ways to get the brightness and the contrast tuned with the basic adjustment tools. Today, we're going to graduate from basic and we're going to move to the curves tool. Now, the curves tool warrants an entire video to itself. So if you'd like to see that, let me know below. But basically, any adjustment you can make to a photo, in theory, could be done with the curves tool. It is unbelievably powerful and there's reasons why you don't do every edit with the Curves tool, but you want to make sure that you're getting good use of it and you spend the time to practice it. So let me show you an example of what it does. Now with the Curves tool, we have this line that represents the brightness and the darkness of our photo in one line. And as long as this line stays right on the middle, nothing has been edited. But what I can do is I can grab the darks and I can make them brighter or I can make the lights darker. And that's pretty cool. And it gives us a little bit more flexibility than what we've seen before in our previous tools. But if you remember the problem with the contrast slider from our previous video is that it just takes the luminance in the middle and squishes everything out of it. So it either becomes dark or bright instead of being in the middle. And that can look fake depending on the exposure of your image. Well, because we have control over the curve, we can actually choose where we introduce contrast. So for example, if I added a dot here on my curve and a dot here, and I pulled this 25% bright up, and I pulled this 25% dark down about the same amount, this is more or less what the contrast slider is doing. And as you crank up the contrast slider, what you're basically going to get is your brights becoming really bright and your darks becoming really dark and then nothing existing in the middle because all of the tones have been squished in either direction. We don't want that. Instead, what we want to do is control where we add darkness and where we add lightness. For this photo, all of the lights are up here and I'm actually pretty happy with where they're at. If anything, you could maybe try and recover some of these highlights because it's a raw photo, but I'm not even gonna waste my time with that. Instead, I'm going to just start pulling this curve down into the right to pull more of this photo into shadow. Now, I don't wanna to go too crazy because the blacks are already a little crushed in this photo. We're already losing detail but I do want to introduce just a little bit more contrast. Now, the highlights, like I said, I don't think they need to be changed too much, but I'm just going to try and move this dot around a little bit so that this curve lines back up with the diagonal somewhere right about here where our brightness is kicked in. And that's a good basic edit with the curves. You can see we've introduced a lot of contrast and we've done it in a way that we selectively chose where the contrast came in. The next thing we're going to do in the luminance department is we're going to introduce some contrast using the clarity and the texture tools that we used before. Now, if you remember, clarity sort of eliminates that atmospheric haze that comes from a photo that's taken over a long distance, maybe it's a landscape, and texture tries to eliminate some of the detail that gets lost, whether it's from your hand shaking while you took the photo or maybe the subject moving slightly and bring back some of the texture into skins or clothing or leaves or things like that. So let's go all the way up. 
So instead of introducing clarity everywhere, which was fine for that long distance landscape photographer where we didn't have a lot of bokeh in the background, we're going to do this selectively. In this particular photo, we're going to turn on selective clarity and try and ignore the highlights. And the reason is because they're out of focus. We don't want to introduce more texture and more clarity into areas that are intentionally blurry and out of focus. Instead, we're going to focus on the shadows and the midtones. And to be honest, I tend to focus on the shadows and the midtones anyway, because our eyes are more sensitive to subtle differences in darker values than we are in lighter values. You can think of when you look at a light bulb or the sun, you don't see a lot of texture, you just see a lot of bright. But when you look around things in your house, you can make out the little tiny textures on your clothing, on the walls and things like that. And that's what we're going to try to bring back to this photo. So I'm going to select the shadows and I'm going to start by trying to bring back some of the texture in the shadows. Now remember, this is the fine grain type of texture that we're going to be bringing back. And as I crank this, you can see especially there's a little in the hair, but it's especially right here in these leaves. Watch how the contrast just starts to pull these leaves off of their background as we play with the texture in here. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to crank this all the way up. Like I love what it's doing here. And then I'm going to introduce clarity. I think of clarity as sort of like the broad brush where texture is the fine little polka dotted brush. And you can see that as I play with this, it adds a lot. But when I look at the overall image, I don't know that I want that much. Like I want detail, but I don't want it competing with our subject. So I'm going to keep this right about here. We want these to still feel dark, but we want them to be visible in the photo. I think that's a good place to start. Now, when it comes to color, this next tool is your best friend. You will probably use it on every single photo once you really master it and understand how it works because it does everything that you really want out of a color adjustment tool. If we scroll down here to selective color, you can see that it actually comes with its own little histogram and it's showing you how much of each color exists in our photo. So in this case, our photo has mostly green and that's not surprising. If you looked at the photo, you could have guessed that this photo was mostly green, but you might be surprised to see that there's virtually no purple or virtually no teal anywhere in this photo. You can see there's a little bit here in these flowers, but they're mostly absent. And that's an important thing to start thinking about before you jump in and edit your colors. I like to identify a couple things. How strong are my red, greens, and blues in my photo? And then what color range is the subject of my photo in? And lastly, which color is most predominant? So this photo, our subject are these people, and people live mostly in the orange. They live a little in the reds and the yellows, which we'll see in a second, but orange is the predominant color for people. And then the predominant photo for our entire picture is green. And that poses a particular problem. Our eyes do not perceive red, green, and blue equally. We're more sensitive to green. And so by default, I try to make sure that we are not blasting users with greens in our photos. It's just something that's overstimulating and it makes it so that we're not really interested in looking for anything else because we're getting the color we're most sensitive to shoved right in our face. Now that's convenient for us because what we're going to do to our greens is very common in popular photos today. So if I select my greens, what I can do is I can actually dial back their brightness so they're not as in our face and I can even dial back their saturation. And the cool thing with green is that really no matter how much saturation they have, as long as there's some in there, it still looks like green. And that's because green, as well as being one that we're most sensitive to, it's one of the colors that our eyes use to visually anchor an image. We look for skin tones, we look for plants, and we look for the sky. In this case, we have plants, and we have skin tones. So we're going to use this to control the mood of the overall photo. Now, to make it so again, it's not all just green and conveniently again, to make it look a little bit more lush, we can actually drag our greens 
over to become more blue and teal. And you can see what that's done. It's a pretty dramatic shift, but maybe too dramatic. Like especially in these areas, it looks like fake plants now because they've been pulled too far. But you can make it pretty far into this area and the plants still look like plants and it takes a little bit of that edge off. Now, the other thing that it's doing is that it's making them more in line with teal. And the reason why teal is important it's the opposite of orange. And the reason why orange is important is that's the color of our subject in this photo. So let's go look at our oranges. Now, if you want a subject to stand out, there's a pretty easy way to do that, and that's just crank up the saturation. And in fact, you can see that in these oranges, that doesn't look terrible. But unfortunately, with our subjects, especially right here where we're getting some of this glow, it looks pretty fake. So if we just give it a little extra saturation, enough that our subject stands out in the photo, it's, it actually works pretty good in making them become the visual focus. Now, the other thing that you can do to make a color look richer without just cranking up the saturation is to make it darker. Our eyes perceive darker colors as more saturated. So we can take our oranges and we can just dial them back a little bit Maybe not all the way, but just a bit. And you can see, just with those two selective color edits we've made, it is dramatic what has happened with our photo. Now that you've seen how this tool works, I'm gonna speed run through the other edits. Basically what I'm gonna to try to do is take it so that everything that isn't orange or green becomes orange or green, or in this case, are like teal green. So for red, what that looks like is becoming darker, becoming maybe a little less saturated, and becoming more orange. And I'm specifically looking at like his nose, which was very, which was very red. I don't want it to look totally orange, and I don't want it to lose all of its contrast with the rest of the skin tones, but I don't want orange to be a standout color either. So I'm gonna pull it just a little bit towards the red, and I'm gonna I'm actually gonna go the other way. I'm gonna make it a little saturated, just so you get that separation between these two, two colors. Now the next is yellow. Yellow can come a little bit more towards the orange, obviously way too far, so let's dial that back. That looks pretty good. And I like to make my yellows become sort of the bright, desaturated version of orange. So it's like the bright, sunny version of orange. Now with our teals, you can see that if I cranked up the saturation, basically no impact. There's a little bit going on in the hat, but there's not a ton. So I'm going to actually turn this up because teal is the opposite of orange. It'll introduce that color contrast. And I'm gonna play with the brightness and just bring it down a little bit. And because you can see specifically with brightness, as I pull that down, it's helping tone down the bright spots on the leaves. Blue you can see is basically non-existent in this photo. It's basically the flowers. So I'm gonna leave the saturation a little bit low, but not dramatic, and I'm gonna turn down the brightness. Again, keep it out of these mid-tones and these highlights where the subjects are, make it so it's not a distraction. I might even pull it a little closer to teal so that these colors are in line with this teal and orange contrast we're gonna get. Purple is also basically non-existent. It's just the flowers. So I'm going to I'm gonna pull it very slightly towards the teal and leave it as is. And with that, you can see our selective colors have absolutely transformed our image. And I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to stop here with your edit, but I wanted to show you one more selective color that was specifically introduced so you can emulate the effects of film. When digital photography moved away from film, they wanted a way to bring back the feel of how chemicals on a piece of celluloid respond to light. That is with the color balance tool. And I'm gonna hide my histogram because this is such a big tool. I want it to fit all on screen here. And you can see it has this three-way color adjustment. And that's because film, the way that subtractively it works, has a different response to colors at each of these different checkpoints. Now, if you'd like a full video on that, let me know. I'd like to make that video as well. But the short version is that in highlights in film, are less saturated. Now, not this much less saturated, but you can see even just dialing back a little bit, it makes these dark tones feel richer because there's less going on in the highlights. 
And then because of how projection works and a little bit because of the chemical response, highlights can either be a pure white bulb of light, so no color tint, or a pretty orange bulb shining through the light, giving it an orange tint. And that would all come through in the highlights. Now, when it comes to the shadows on film, again, because of the subtractive nature of film, shadows are always more saturated. Now, in this case, you really can't see it very much. It's coming through a little bit in the sweater, and I'm certain this is not showing up at all on YouTube. But we're going to really dial up the saturation. Maybe not 100%, but, I don't know, 70% or something. And then the other thing is, most film, the chemicals are more blue in the shadows. And you can see we can actually be pretty dramatic with this and it doesn't make the photo look fake at all. So I'm going to go something like that. And it also has the nice benefit that this lines up with our teal and orange scheme that we're going with. There's a reason why teal and orange is the most common color grade in any film or photography. And so you can see it's not dramatic. You notice it most in these leaves up here, but it does make a difference. And so with these three tools, you're going to get the majority of the bang for your buck when it comes to your color edit. Next time, we're going to be talking about some of the finer grain tools that will help you get very specific looks, especially emulating other mediums like film. And we're also going to have deeper dive videos on things like the curves if you guys like them. So make sure you stick around for that. And also make sure you stick around for big updates to Pixelmator and Photomator. I, I can't wait to show you guys what they've been working on. All right, we'll catch you next time. Thank you.